Hi everyone, this is The Scrutinizer, aka Dr. Minakshi Nobu. So on April 29, in 1878, Louis Posture had read a paper um, for French Academy of Sciences, where he had said, and I quote, it is a terrifying thought that the life is at mercy of these minute bodies, he's referring to the microbes, and that it is a consoling hope that science will not always remain powerless before such enemies. Little did he know that in 21st century, we have learned nothing in the past 200 years, and we are still at the mercy of those little microbes. But whatever we did learn, we are questioning it. And we are in a way going backwards and questioning what? The hand washing. Is hand washing proven to stop infection, which is respiratory in nature? Okay, like, I don't know, measles, TB, and of course, our special virus, SARS CoV 2. So I'm pretty sure that if Lois Posture were to come back or he was alive at this time, he would have been so, so disappointed in us. And either he would have committed suicide, would go back to grave if he could, because all the germs he made friends with, that was just in vain. We have learned nothing. And like I always say, that in the serenity of the lab and library, I found two best friends, a book and a germ. Meaning that in this 21st century, we would have not even faced the pandemic had we listened to the book. The book in this case being the epidemiology or the infectious disease book, but that is my best friend. And the germ. In this case, the germ is our favorite virus, which is the SARS-CoV-2, and it gets a A plus in doing what it does. I will always be bringing this up because even as a measly little scientist, I cannot comprehend that we took a tragedy. A tragedy happened and we turned it into a living nightmare. And why did we do that? Because, because we don't believe in science. What I want to do today is reply to a number of questions that have come to me. And uh, most of these, in a way, they are scary because they are from clinicians. Now, if the clinicians, like family practitioners, the pediatric, the ER pediatricians, neurosurgeons, or the orthopedic surgeons, then I believe there would be more in misinformation and fear in the society because their patients, they have to believe them. You know, for the patient, the doctor is, uh, he knows the best. So, without wasting any time, the first question it is from, I'll just use the initials, okay? Um, just so that they know I'm replying to their questions. The first question is from Dr. S.V., who is an excellent, excellent neurosurgeon. Having said that, we also know that he is uh, not a research scientist and not an infectious disease specialist, and the book and the germ are not his best friends. They're only my best friends. <laughs> so, but I appreciate the fact that he at least tried finding literature and he sent it to me to justify his argument. In the end, it seems that he's, he's justifying his opinion, not an argument, not a fact. But I wanted to take this up and uh, I guess reply or provide uh, a good reference in exchange for what he did. So the question number one is, Minakshi Noel, I have lived through many viral influenza seasons and never have I ever heard of any studies or mandates of surgical and cloth masks that were implemented to prevent influenza deaths. But whatever the whole, if it just saves one life mantra. Yet, you're trying to tell me that we could have been preventing hundreds of thousands of influenza deaths each and every single year worldwide by mandating surgical and cloth masks to be worn by everyone everywhere. Yet there has never been any such recommendation made or any studies to support these actions or that thesis. So just to say, I mean, I have taken the relevant question out of his 
very very long questions and then he also says that um that trying to keep the virus away with a a uh, surgical mask or a cloth mask is like keeping mosquitoes away from a barbed wire. Good luck. Okay. Good point, address. First of all, influenza is not what we are discussing. We are not discussing seasonal flu, the seasonal influenza. We are discussing COVID-19 that happens with SARS-CoV-2. Yes, all these viruses, the SARS-1, the SARS-2, the influenza, they all belong to a big family of coronaviruses. But every virus is different and we are stuck in a pandemic which is being caused by COVID-19. And the prevention methods we discussed are also not from seasonal flu, they are for COVID-19. Now, if we incorrectly conclude that COVID-19 is just another flu, we will, and we have, in the United States at least, we have retreated from the strategies that would uh, work in minimizing the spread of the virus and there is so it's very important that we make that distinction so I'm going to provide some numbers and I hate numbers just to reply to Dr. S's question I have actually calculated how CDC reports the influenza deaths and then how they have compared to COVID-19. So there is an incorrect comparison that I've seen and it has been published and CDC even agreed on its own that the COVID-19 deaths until today, they are being reported and counted. However, the influenza deaths are estimated. So every year they're calculated by an algorithm that CDC has based on submitted international classification of disease codes. And I just want to say this in very short. And if somebody needs the real numbers, I would be very happy to provide those. And if Dr. S needs them, definitely. So from 23, uh, 2013 to 2014, the estimated influenza deaths that, that were reported by CDC were 23,000. Per CDC, and I am not making it up, this is per CDC, they said that when they counted the deaths, they were 3,448. Similarly, in 2018 to 2019, the estimated deaths, influenza deaths, that CDC reported were 61,000. However, when they were counted by CDC itself, they were 15,620. So in a way, whatever the reason is, and it's an algorithm, and I'm not criticizing that. So CDC estimates almost six times higher than actual counted death rates. In contrast, COVID-19 deaths are being counted and they are not estimated. So the best comparison would be to count both of them. In short, the mean number of counted deaths during the peak week of influenza season from 2013 to 2020 is 752.4. And CDC has estimated six times higher, as I already mentioned. But COVID-19 deaths in the U.S. in the week of April 21. So this week of 20, um, April 21, I took 2020 because I had taken the influenza as the peak season. So COVID-19 deaths in April 21, 2020 were 15,445, meaning COVID deaths were 14.4 fold greater than influenza or the seasonal flu deaths, apparent peak week of the current season. So until today, and this is not a mistake, until today, November 25, 2020, there have been 263,000 deaths in the United States alone. And I will not let you forget, we are in 21st century because whenever I've said this, people have come to me and even the same neurosurgeons have come to me and said, well, measles claimed more lives or the 1918 bird flu claimed more lives. Yes, similarly, smallpox did that too, but during that time, they didn't even know what immunology is. We do. And remember, we have a book, we have a germ. So the explanation is 
that coronavirus kills between 9.5 to 44 times more people than the seasonal flu. In other words, Dr. S, coronavirus is not anything like flu. It is much, much worse. But secondly, seasonal flu, as I know, is an upper respiratory illness and lower tract is only involved if if the person gets pneumonia infection which they do because of the vulnerable people there are um however the covid cases that involved the breathing trouble or the lungs all of them had the involvement of lower respiratory tract that gave glass like symptoms in the lung which is which is similar to pneumonia and then the flu only involves the respiratory tract but we know that our best friend SARS-CoV-2 its symptomology is all over the place it has given neurological symptoms the GI symptoms and this doesn't happen in case of seasonal flu so I'm trying to distinguish this that this is not just an ordinary flu this is a pandemic we do need the measures in place so that it is not spread or at least we can get a hold on it Lastly, I want everyone, or at least Dr. S, to look at the published genomic sequence of COVID-19 that had come out in um, January 2020. And now you do the homology with seasonal flu or every year's flu, because, you know, we know the flu virus mutates. What similarity do you see? And that should tell you that we are dealing with a pandemic which does not involve just another flu. So the question two from Dr. S is, Menakshi, to address your question directly, a mask that does indeed filter out viral particles could perhaps prevent someone from potentially getting sick. If indeed the mask is truly a viral filter, however, not all masks are created equal regarding specifically to surgical masks and cloth masks they were not made to filter viral particles nor do they filter viral particles surgical masks are used to prevent bacterial contamination or infection in open wound surgical wounds not to prevent viral transmission yes as i have mentioned before i have an, i have articles and i have some videos and dr s i gave you the links to those so the masks are not designed as bacterial or viral or dust filters. They are designed with pore size. So anything falling in that particular pore size of that mask, it would be filtered out. Whatever the contaminant is, bacteria, virus, an elephant, I don't care. So as I, as I have explained in my previous um, articles also that N95 is the only mask that can filter out particles less than 0.1 micron meters okay so I have laid stress on how the clinicians who go who come in contact with the COVID patients or even you if you go to the hospital you're a neurosurgeon you definitely on everyday basis need to wear an N95 it's called an N95 because it uh, filters out the viral particles which are less than 0.1 micron meter with 95 percent efficiency that's the best we got for the rest of us who are not coming in contact with patients we are just going out to run errands we can get away with a and i quote with what dr s says a loose fitting surgical device or a cloth mask so the surgical or the paper mask, it has a complicated network of fibers and much smaller pores in multiple layers in comparison to the cloth masks. So they still have a filtering efficiency. Does not mean that if they are filtering particles less than 0.1 micrometers, but they, are, they could be prevented to going uh, inside the mask. And this is where your question of that the mask can make people sick comes in to which I have responded to the people in my article and in my video that that the proper disposal is very important because the cloth masks are going to filter 80 to 500 micrometer cloths and I looked at literature and in 2020 within the past six months there are numerous and these are really great studies these are done with uh, physicists in uh, 
collaboration with the life scientists where they have taken the trajectory the the pressure um, you know around the loose fitting devices so called uh, and the cloth mask that if we are not in a covid heavy area if we are not a clinician then we can get away and not um not catch covid so this is uh so the the right use and the right disposal method comes into picture so our virus to reiterate again is 0 0.12 micrometers in size and literature states that five micrometer or smaller particles in size can remain airborne indefinitely under most indoor conditions not outdoors indoors so this tells us we do not want these particles inside our living space or in your office or especially in the dental office okay question number three is minakshi Noel. we do not wear surgical masks to prevent viral transmissions however typical loose fitting surgical mask or cloth mask is not made nor intended to be used for viral protection surgical masks are used to prevent bacterial contamination or infections in open wound uh, open surgical wounds not to prevent viral transmissions yet this has been brought to the question so now we're going to discuss uh, i think there are two or three references that dr s has sent to me and i'm going to discuss those and this is regarding um, the use of the surgical face masks in an OR setting because now apparently we have so much time at hand we don't de need to deal with pandemic we're gonna question the already um, protocol in place that we need to wear a surgical mask if we are operating on a patient and that is yes to prevent infection in the patient however we want to use the resources the time let's do it uh he has sent me this reference which is um let me see so does evidence-based so he he's questioning this dr s is saying that does evidence-based medicine support the effectiveness of surgical face masks in preventing post-operative wound infections in elective surgery and there's a reference for this which is and this is a reference from 2009 and i have no idea where did he find where did you find this journal dr s but this is a journal which is published as an internal journal from a medical college in pakistan okay it's indexed because they took a uh, french indexing number which is none of my concern but the point is this is a systematic review the author says it's a systematic review and they are only looking for surgeries which were for clean wound okay so out of 250 citations so you have to read this whole article you have to look at the statistics and then decide what they are saying and whether we can agree or not you took the first sentence that you liked from their abstract okay so i looked at as a biochemist i have to look at statistics and i have to read the entire article it's a four page review article and they out of 250 citations they have taken 84 uh, relevant studies and then they say that out of these 84 relevant studies, there were only 13 that were considered to be potentially relevant. Now, out of these 13, there are only two trials that match the inclusion criteria. It is a very narrow criteria because they're only looking for a clean wound surgery and in the present and presence and absence of a surgical mask. And I'm not sure how based on this the authors have reached the conclusion that and i quote they are saying with or without masks the infection rate was same rather infection decreased with discarding the masks completely in 1980. i will have to remind again 
we are in, I have forgotten actually reminding, 2020. Why are we looking at 1980 and that also one study? Now, the same authors then further, they have stated that surgical face masks are still a means of protection for surgeons to help avoid contact with the face and mucous membranes. Therefore, they should be worn by the theater staff. So contradicting their own conclusion or actually giving a good discussion. That's what I would say, a good discussion. So there is no study and they are even saying, they, they further, and I quote that they are saying that there is no study regarding the use of masks in orthopedics, vascular, cardiac, plastic, and reconstructive surgery. And major majority of these branches of surgery use implants and grafts where wound infection could have dangerous consequences. And on the basis of current literature, no recommendations can be made regarding change of practice of wearing face masks. So you see, if in these other surgeries, a surgeon is not comfortable performing a surgery without a face mask, that should tell you that a minimum face mask to prevent contamination of the wound, we should not be wasting any more time and resources in, in arguing over it. So, but here I want to take the example of this journal for my audience as well, or the non-scientists, so they know how to choose a reference. The number one thing is when you look at a journal, you look at a study like here, Dr. S looked at the study and he thought it's a meta-analysis and he chose it that they are saying uh, that face masks are not relevant. You need to see number one, is this an international journal? Because that is where the competition lies. And as a neurosurgeon, you must know the competition. So if people have a good data, they will not go publishing in this journal. They would go to an international journal like, I don't know, Nature, JBC, Virology, Vaccinology or whatnot. So, and secondly, like I already mentioned, that this journal that we're discussing is an internal journal of a local college. Any article would get published in this. But the most important factor is that this journal has an impact factor of 0 0.25. In comparison, to give you an idea, Nature, the journal Nature, it has an impact factor of 45. I have not met a journal which had an impact factor of even one. So no one uses articles from these journals to make a statement uh, to say or um, to make a mandate, okay? Because there is a non-existent impact factor. A non-existent impact factor tells you uh, people don't read it and the studies are local or they they would always be published and this, they are not statistically sound or experimentally. Okay, so the reference to, this is from the Nursing Times from 2003. Again, we are in 2020. However, in this nursing, I'm not gonna go into those details because the journal authors, they themselves have said here that currently there is little evidence that wearing a surgical mask provides sufficient protection from all hazards and for this use for this reason the use of a respirator or a face shield should be considered depending on the situation yes that is what we all say depending on the situation we need a different mask and they are also saying that there is a lack of robust evidence for protecting nurse and patient and uh, so they, um, so they are citing the same reference from Sackett et al. in 1996 that you, Dr. S, has taken a sentence out of it that that this remains to be debated. But that was 1996. This is 2020, and I would again say, let's use our resources for moving forward, not going backwards. But there is a really good article that Dr. S has sent. He says, and I quote, 
Minakshi, no. Let's turn our attention to some real data. I'm all for it. And this is a, let me see if I have a journal name, but um, I guess not. This is, this is a 2020 article. Yes, it's from Emerging Infectious Diseases. And this, according to the journal authors, they are writing that this is uh, supported by WHO and done in collaboration with Chinese CDC. And so Dr. S has writing here and I quote, but before I quote, I would say what he's writing, it's exactly what's written in this journal abstract. And what's written in this journal abstract is not from the authors of that, that article. They are further quoting from the references they are citing. So they are saying that disposable medical masks, also known as surgical masks, are loose fitting devices that were designed to be worn by medical personnel to protect accidental contamination of patient wounds and to protect the wearer against splashes or sprays of bodily fluids. There is limited evidence for their effectiveness in preventing influenza virus transmission, either when worn by the infected person for source control or when they are worn by uninfected persons to reduce exposure. Our systematic review found no significant effect of face masks on transmission of laboratory confirmed influenza. Okay. So their systematic review is questioning the masks and they have not found no significant effect, right? Their systematic review did not even find a significant effect of hand hygiene, a body hygiene, respiratory adequate. There is a lack of scientific evidence according to them to support this measure, whether respiratory adequate is an effective non-pharmaceutical intervention in preventing influenza virus transmission remains questionable. It remains questionable and worthy of future research. Yes, like I have it reiterated, I don't know, infinite number of times. We have so much time at hand during a pandemic. Let's go backwards and discuss. Shall we sneeze all over the place on the people's faces? We need to cough on them because the harm that this kind of study does is I discuss with um, teenagers because I volunteer for uh, for the national classrooms, virtual classrooms, for the low-income schools. And uh, so I discussed this article with high school students. And what happens there? They were like, yay, if CDC says we don't need to take a shower, we are not taking a shower. If CDC says we don't need to wash hands before we eat, why should we? Because there is no evidence. I leave it to all of you to decide, shall we just go back i don't know everyone likes paleo food anyway so we can go into paleo era relearn our etiquettes the authors of this study they go on to say and i quote we similarly found limited evidence on the effectiveness of improved hygiene even environmental cleaning we identified several major knowledge gaps requiring further research most fundamentally, an improved characterization of the modes of person-to-person -person transmission. Hello, influenza, aerosols, or the droplets, or the breath, I don't know. So now I read this whole article and I've read it very thoroughly. I've, and one thing I always do is I check each and every reference and I read their references. So I looked at the meta-analysis and the statistics and the experimental design. And the studies they have chosen for their meta-analysis, they are flawed in how they measure the contamination. I don't think I, I can take, I would love to take each and every um, experiment they have chosen in this study, but I don't think I can in this video. But if there would be enough interest, we will just discuss this one article because this is for uh, first of all, a neurosurgeon sent to me and then the it's said that the WHO might make mandates. So the flaw is, first of all, they took these studies from 
all over the all over the place meaning they have taken it actually from the backward areas in uh, china in middle east and so forth where they didn't have clean water and so forth then they have swiped the surface the hands and analyzed the material with rtpcr now that does not mean that there was no contamination it could mean that they did not get enough either they did not get the enough organisms on their swab or their method of uh, PCR was not that sensitive. So that needs to be looked at because just because there is no amplification of a DNA does, and that, that DNA doesn't exist, that's not the answer. Then, there, then secondly, I saw that there are a number of flaws in the studies that the authors have mentioned themselves. So they are discussing it, which is a good thing. So I, I'm pretty sure, or I don't know, how WHO can make mandates from this because the data is all over the place. And lastly, the authors have not taken into account any good recent articles. Had they done a thorough search of the, of the literature, like they're supposed to do it. If they are doing a meta-analysis, they are doing a systematic review, they are supposed to look at the past 100 years of literature starting from today. So from here, they are saying they don't know if the transmission is via aerosols or how this influenza virus or the COVID is um, transmitted. And then they don't know the temperature, they don't know the humidity. Then they're saying more research is needed to know, should we wash our hands? Uh, should there be respiratory etiquette or what is that? I really want to quote Einstein here when he says, is it I or the world is crazy? So the authors are stating that it's essential to note that the mechanism of person-to-person -person transmission have not yet fully determined. Controversy remains over the transmission through fine particle aerosols. Thus, the efforts to control the next pandemic, you see, we haven't controlled this pandemic, but the authors are saying the efforts to control the next pandemic will rely largely on non-pharmaceutical interventions and they're, they are citing all this from a reference in this article, it's reference number 46, which comes from another WHO collaborative study with China CDC. Okay, so basically they are saying they don't know how influenza virus is transmitted. And so that's why they don't know what a non-pharmaceutical measure should be. I guess the scrutinizer comes in and I would provide you with the excellent references that you are welcome to read and debate with me. So there are four suspected modes of influenza virus transmission, which is through number one, direct physical contact with an infected individual, or number two, transmission via intermediate, often inanimate objects. These are called fomites. Number three is transmission via droplets. They are expelled from infected individual by sneezing or coughing that deposit on nasal or oral mucosa of the susceptible individuals. And number four are the airborne transmissions via expelled particles, which are 2.5 uh, micrometers in radius radius okay or less than 2.5 and these are referred to as a droplet nuclei and these are the ones that remain suspended in air as aerosols for extended period of time okay so now this all depends on humidity and so from um i'm i'm going to take an example of a really great article from pnas i think it's from pnas uh, I'm taking that one because these authors, their article came out in 2020. Basically, this article is saying, because these are physicists, so they have their own bickering 
platform where they are saying relative humidity is better or absolute humidity is better to explain the vapor pressure or the concentration um, of these droplets okay so it doesn't bother us as much because if we can have an answer so relative humidity it is the ratio of the actual vapor pressure or the concentration to the saturation vapor pressure okay so means it is defined as the equilibrium partial pressure of water vapor above a flat surface i'm mentioning this so everyone knows that just to say that the transmission happens from a cough or how the particle travels it's not just that simple it has other factors that would affect the droplets for example they have done animal studies also okay and they have described what the humidity conditions are the virus laden droplet nuclei they are more efficiently produced when the relative humidity is low because there is increased evaporation of expelled droplet particles so that the virus remains airborne longer okay meaning the influenza virus survival increases as relative humidity decreases or that the airborne virus will remain uh, viable longer at a low relative humidity then there is a question of sedimentation because somebody coughs these are the particles and these are virus laden droplets and so it's not that they coughed and it just fell on the surface now there are other forces that are at play these are two opposing forces gravitational acceleration which will bring the particle towards the surface of the earth and then there is stokes factor the drag force a friction which provides acceleration opposite to the particle motion away from the surface so i am saying in short that just to say how the particle is transmitted how long it stays we can't just we can't just look at say six feet the mandate that was done was based on the size of this virus and that we just assume just so that we can have some hold on this epidemic okay if we are standing outside there is wind there's trajectory then there are these other forces of nature that come into play so there are a lot of really really good uh, studies that are out there now that can explain how and why the influenza virus is transmitted how it survives and uh, how long okay but i before i finish i want to really go over this really excellent excellent study because it came in june 15th of june 2020 and i actually and it's it's an indoor air but what i appreciate is that this was just a um they were reporting about a rehearsal of a about a weekly rehearsal uh of singing so they did their due diligence that they had six feet apart the seats they took the names ages contact of every person that was involved and there were 53 people and it was found out that after that two of those people died and they had contracted covid and when they looked at it the their the director is the one who was infected with covid so they actually turned this opportunity i must say as an opportunistic very opportunistic of them um, to study how the infection would spread so they looked at the index case who would have been seated in proximity to a small uh, proportion of the members if the infection only spread at short distance or from mouth to mouth then it would have been low because the second the in the secondary infection rate in this case was 32 out of 60 to 52 out of 60 which is 53 to 87 percent so if the transmission by close contact or fomites was the dominant mode of transmission then the secondary attack rate should have been much smaller because the people who were sitting far away from the conductor not the director conductor they it would have been a low rate however we see there was no um 
there was no systematics how the infection was spread. So the secondary cases being 53 to 87 percent show that it is a respiratory aerosol is the mode of transmission because it's a shared air that was leading the mode of transmission. And from here they have done other studies also and um, meaning they have taken, they have determined the average airborne quanta concentration uh, from the reported secondary infection rate. And uh, like I said, if people would be interested, I would take each and every of these studies and we can have one discussion per, uh, per, uh, per of these articles. Other than that, I would say there is plethora of good literature right now and uh, it completely explains that why my, my, my best friend, the book, when it talks about the germ, that why the mask is needed, why we should have a social distancing. Now lockdown, lockdown I would be explaining in different next video because it is very long, but lockdown would have been beneficial if we did it right in the beginning. Now, I, I even I don't know how to do this. So the lockdown now being done is so to say that if the virus does not find another host, maybe we can get a foot, maybe we can get a hold on the virus or the virus can lose a foothold. Because this virus, any virus has to multiply in a host. Now, when there are no hosts available, and that brings me to the I don't want to hear about the herd immunity in, in the absence of a vaccine, and I would explain it. But if we are maintaining these three criteria, having a social uh, distancing, a mask, and kind of lockdown means to just stop the movement. After one year, I don't know if we can do it or should do it, but the previous two things, yes. So then it's possible that the virus will not find new hosts. It doesn't find new hosts. It cannot replicate and it would go into, into uh, it will become dormant. It will go into dormancy. It will come back. It's an influenza virus after all. So um, these are the answers for today. And I have quite a few more interesting questions. Uh, which I will take, uh, which I'll be replying in the next video. And so for now, as I always say, think critically. In this case, I would also say, try reading my best friends, the book and the germ, and stay healthy. Okay, the scrutinizer out.